Okay, so once again, like I was saying, this is the male guppy question. So male guppies, in nature, the males are typically more colorful than the females, right? However, in areas where the um, there's a lot of predators, you don't want to be brightly colored because you don't want to draw a lot of attention to yourself, right? So the brightly, more brightly colored you are, the more attention you draw, the more likely you are to get eaten. So these fish in areas where there's predators, they are not colorful. But the same fish, if you put them in an area where, they, where there's less predators, they become more colorful, not because they magically decide to, and they're like, hey, I'm gonna be colorful now, and poof, they're colorful. But because they're, when they have babies, the colorful babies don't get eaten, so they grow up to pass on their colorful genes to their babies, and more and more colorful fish pop up over time, right? So, uh, which of these is most likely to happen over a few generations if we take guppies, male guppies, from a place where there's a lot of predators in their dole and put them in a place with few predators where most of the other fish are colorful? Well, the mortality rate or the death rate of the guppies go up. Well, we're putting them in a place with less predators, so why would that happen? So, it's not that. Would the offspring stop competing for resources? Well, no, there still be competition. Uh, just because there's no predators doesn't mean there's not any competition, okay? There will be an increase in the mutations in the offspring. We can't possibly know that. So it must be D. There will be an increase in the number of colorful guppies. And doesn't that make sense, right, over time? the Because uh, the colorful babies will now be allowed to live longer and pass on their colorful genes. Okay, I know you remember this question. You probably recognize the picture. Um, so this is pretty self-explanatory. You almost don't even need the question to know what's going on here. You can just look at the picture. So we've got beetles on a tree bark. Some are light, some are dark. Some blend in better than others. And then there's a bird eating a dark one. Why is the bird eating the dark one and not the light one? Just like the male guppies. The, you know, if you stand out, you're more likely to get eaten, right? So which result is likely to occur to the beetle population? I'm sorry, is likely to occur to the beetle population due to predation over time. So if the bird is eating the beetles, what's going to happen? Are we going to have more dark colored beetles, less light colored beetles, more light colored beetles? What are we going to have? We're going to have more light colored beetles than dark colored beetles over time, right? So, which one is that? Must be A, yeah. The number of light-colored beetles in the population will increase, right? Okay, which statement does not accurately describe natural selection? Okay. So what does not describe natural selection? Remember, natural selection is um, when nature selects who lives and who dies. It doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean like a natural way for somebody to select something. It is nature itself selecting who lives and who dies. And the way that nature selects it, you know, is very cruel, right? If you're weak or you're you have bad genes or whatever, then you are going to die or at least not make babies, right? You may not die, but if you're like a guy and you're perfectly healthy, you're just ugly, right? You're probably not going to get a mate, right? So, you know, bad gene, that's, that would be like a form of bad genes. Not necessarily in people, but more like in birds if you're not brightly colored enough, you know? even though you're perfectly healthy. You may live a long, full life, but just never have kids. Um, individual organisms' fur turns white during the winter to camouflage them in the snow. Does that sound like natural selection? Well, no, let's, let's keep reading. Uh, the genetic composition of a population changes from one generation to the next. That sounds like things that are doing well uh, pass on more genes than things that are not doing well, right? So that sounds kind of like natural selection. 
Uh, more advantageous traits become more common in populations. Well, as a result of the more fit things growing older and having more kids, uh, that would happen. So that sounds like natural selection. Beneficial and useful traits are inherited generation after generation. That's true, too. That's All three of these are basically saying the same thing. Uh, so it must be a, a thing that does not describe natural selection. Okay. Which statement best explains what is happening to reindeer, the reindeer population in the Arctic? So if you go back up and you read what's happening, basically the reindeer are getting smaller. They're not as big as they used to be. That's basically it. And the reason why is because um, when it gets warmer, instead of the snow being light, fluffy snow that the reindeer can just scooch to the side and eat the grass underneath, that snow actually melts into water and then refreezes as ice and the reindeer can't get to the grass underneath the ice. So they're not eating as much, so they're smaller, okay? And it's directly related to uh, the weather, it being warmer. So which statement best explains what is happening to the reindeer population in the Arctic? We're basically just taking what I just said and finding the answer choice that says the same thing, just in different words. So which one of these is saying that, you know, due to warmer temperatures, reindeer aren't eating as much and therefore they're smaller? Um, I go, well, C says that the winters are getting colder. Remember, they're actually getting warmer. Um, B? D is in dog? Okay. The warmer summer and winter months have led to an increased population of reindeer that are smaller in size. Um, did it say that the population increased? They mate more? Okay, maybe. Okay. That's, I'm not saying D is wrong. Let's just check A and B first. Uh, we know it's not C. D is a maybe. Uh, let's look at A. Reindeer are just to the warming temperature, so only those with thicker coats can survive. Uh, no. If it's warmer, you don't need thicker coats, right, first of all. Second of all, it didn't say anything about the thickness of the coats. So B, individual reindeer can quickly adapt. No. Okay. So it must be D. That sounds good, yeah. So I guess they are reproducing more, aren't they? Because it's warmer more often. But they are also smaller. Not that that's a bad thing necessarily. What is the best explanation for the different types of beaks in the finch? So we got these four finches, you know, about Darwin. You know, he looked at the finches, right? How all these birds at one point. Oops, hold on. All these birds at one point used to look the same. Over time, each bird settled a different island. There's different food sources on each island. And over time, the birds' beaks changed size and shape. Obviously, because of the different kinds of food that were available. If you're going to crack open a walnut, you need a different beak than if you're going to eat a sunflower seed, right? Or a tiny little bug. You don't need a big jaw. Uh, natural selection caused each species of finch to have the type of beak best suited for survival in its environment. That is correct, right? This one's easy. It didn't say anything about explorers. Now, even if explorers had brought finches to the islands, if the question didn't say that, you don't pick it. Remember I told you to stick with the pick, stick with what they give you in the picture? Well, also stick with the words, too, the description. They didn't say anything about that, so just rule that out automatically. The finches are capable of adjusting their beak type. No, finches can't just change their beak type at will. Okay? The type of beak on each individual finch depends on what mutations they receive during reproduction. Nope. So, obviously, yeah, D. Well, we already knew that. I'm just telling you 
why A, B, and C were wrong. All right, which statement best describes how bacterial resistance to antibiotics demonstrates natural selection? You guys use Germex, right? Yeah, you probably think, oh, I'm using Germex. I'm, I'm, I'm helping. I'm being healthy. This is what I'm supposed to do. I'm protecting other people from getting sick from my germs. I'm not spreading my germs. I'm also not getting other people's germs on me. Well, here's the problem, though. What you don't realize when you're using Germix, and this is why I don't use it personally. Um, also, antibacterial soap. Like anytime you have a soap or cleaning agent that kills bacteria, you're actually speeding up the creation of super bacteria. Let me explain. So, on your hands, you have billions of bacteria all over your hands, right? When you use Germex or antibacterial soap, you're killing germs, sure. You know how it always says it kills 99.9% .9 of germs? You guys know how it says that? It never says it kills 100%, right? Why? Because you can't possibly kill 100% of billions of bacteria on your hands. That 0.1% left over that doesn't die doesn't die because it has an immunity or a tolerance to the germex or the soap. So that 0.1% left over is like a super... And then when they reproduce, all of their copies that they make of themselves are all resistant to the germex and the soap. So now next time you get that stuff on you, you use germex, it doesn't do anything. And you keep doing that, fast forward into the future, Germex doesn't work anymore. All right. So um, this, is what they're, this is what they're saying is happening in this question. Bacteria are developing a resistance to antibiotics. You guys get antibiotics a lot. You get a cold, you get a cough, you go to the doctor, what do they give you? Antibiotics, almost every single time, right? Amoxicillin, penicillin, ampicillin, some, some, something that ends in psyllin, right? So all those things, uh, the bacteria that it doesn't kill develop a tolerance or a resistance to it. So what is saying, which of these four things is just saying what I just said, where they develop a tolerance or a resistance to it over time because the ones that are resistant to it don't die when you get the antibiotic and then they reproduce and now you have, let's see, we have C or D. Let's look at C. The human immune system has become desensitized. No, that's not true. Uh, D, the bacterial cells that are able to survive the antibiotics reproduce bacteria die, causing the bacteria population to have more resistant individuals over time. That is correct. Okay. Yes. So that's just natural selection, but it's almost like not natural selection because it's humans doing it. Like when you take an antibiotic, that's not nature, that's you, but it is still considered natural selection. In other words, the weak, D as in dog, the weaker ones die, the stronger ones live on, only we're the ones forcing that to happen, so it's going to just get worse over time. So in this question, um, if you read the question, remember this is the Industrial Revolution question, where the moths these moths used to look like this before the Industrial Revolution, and after the Industrial Revolution, they look like this. Why? Because there's these factories during the Industrial Revolution that were putting out a bunch of pollution, right? And then the trees in the surrounding area used to be light colored, and these moths blended in with the trees, but then after all the pollution, it literally made the trees dark.
because the bark was literally stained with all the ash and coal and pollution, right? So the moths used to blend in when the trees were lighter colored, but after all the pollution stained the trees dark, moths with this dark color blended in more. And of course, the better you blend in, the less you get eaten, right? So naturally, their numbers went down and these guys' numbers went up. So this form of natural selection, what kind of natural selection is this? Is it stabilizing? Remember, we have light, we have dark, and then we have medium. Um, correct. So if dark is being favored over light, then that means that it's going to look like this, right? We're favoring one over the other. That is directional. Directional selection, right? If it were stabilizing, then stabilizing would be no dark, no light, but medium is good. If it were... Oops. I guess I can only undo so much. If it were uh, stabilizing, medium would be good. If it were disruptive, disruptive would be where light is good and dark is good, but medium is bad. But directional is where one is good over the other. And in this case, dark is good over light. So that's why that's directional. Okay. Fossil records indicate that the size of European black bears has increased between ice ages. It increased between ice ages. Uh, what would the graph look like for bears for natural selection? So what would the graph look like for the bears? Now the solid line, the solid line right here, that's before. And then the dashed line is after. So we have size here. So of course it goes left to right. So we have small on this end, we have big on this end, right? So if they're larger after and the dashed line is after, then we want the after line should be further toward the big end, right? Well, the big end is on the right-hand side, so which one of these has a dashed line that's further toward the big end on the right? A, right? C, the after line is, you know, the bears are getting either small or large, but medium is going down, right? So that's not what's happening. Down here, we have medium is going up and small size is going down and big size is going down. That's not right, that's not what's happening. Same thing here, the after line, medium size is going up, small is going down, large is going down. That's also not right. So it's gotta be this one. After, large is going up, small is going down. Okay, what is the best explanation for this phenomenon? Well, we gotta go back and read about the rock pocket mouse. Um, most of these mice have a light brown fur that allows them to blend in with the desert rocks where they live. However, there is an area with black rock left over from old volcanic eruptions. So if the rock in this one area is black, what color do you think the mice that live there on that black rock are going to be? More than likely. They're going to be dark colored, right? In that one area. 
Why? Not because they got together and decided that they needed to be dark in order to avoid predators, but because all of the ones that weren't dark stood out and got eaten and were not able to pass on their genes. So, what says what I just said? The dark colored mice lived on, passed on their genes because they lived long enough to do it. Let's see, the dark colored mice survived and passed on their genes to their offspring so that over time the population became mostly dark colored. That sounds about right, but let's just rule out these other ones just to be sure. The light colored mice began expressing dark fur, no. The dark colored mice were stronger than the light colored mice, no. The light colored mice all experienced the same mutation, no. So there you go, we know it must be A. You knew that already. I was just proving it to you. All right. You guys remember the question about deer and why we have deer season in late November? Deer season meaning hunting season. You're not allowed to hunt deer until the end of November. Why? Because that's when their breeding season ends is late November. Okay, but why do deer only breed during this short time? You think that if deer wanted to be successful, they would have as many babies as possible year round. However, they don't because it takes a lot of time and effort to have a baby. If you're going to have a baby, you want to make sure it lives. Okay, because they only have one or two babies at a time. And it's a lot of investment raising a baby if you're a deer. So if they're going to have a baby, they want to maximize its chances of living. If you want to maximize the baby's chance of living, it needs to be born during this time here, May, June, July. Why? Because there's more food available, right? So we, the deer breed during this time so that by the time the mom goes through pregnancy and has the baby, the baby is born during this time when what's important about being born in May, June, and July versus being born in the dead of winter. More food. More warmth. It's warmer, there's more food, right? I think we can all agree that it's easier to survive when it's warm and there's plenty of food around than when it's freezing cold and you don't have anything to eat, right? Pretty common sense. Which condition is essential for natural selection to result in a new species? Unlimited resources? If I have all the food in the entire world, if we are all the human population, everyone in this room, if we are the human population and we have all the food we need, then are we creating a situation where only the strong can survive? No, natural selection, remember, only the strongest or the fittest survive. So natural selection needs a, a scenario where only the strongest or fittest can survive. Unlimited resources, unlimited food, water, space to live, all that, that does not create an environment where only the strongest ones can survive. You need an environment where there's just, just enough to support a few of you, but not all of you. So there's about eight of us in this room, right? But if we only had enough resources like food, water, space for four of us, well, which four are going to get it? Right, the most fit, okay? So unlimited resources is not a good uh, thing to increase natural selection. An inherited variation, probably, that, that's important. A static environment, meaning one that does not change, no. If you have a stable environment, that doesn't really create a competitive atmosphere. A long lifespan, again, no, that doesn't really create a, a competitive atmosphere if we all live long, happy lives, right? 
So an inherited variation. Some of us need to be able to do things better than others because we have an inherited variation. The ability of an organism to compete successfully for environmental resources, survive predation, resist disease, and live to adulthood affects the organism's what? Correct. Yeah, well, it doesn't increase its genetic, it has nothing to do with genetics. So you can't, by doing these things, by competing for resources successfully, by surviving predation, by resisting disease, none of those things change your genetics. Your genetics are what they are. Being good in life doesn't make your genetics better. Having better genetics can make you better in life. Okay? If you have better genetics, you will survive better in life and therefore have more reproductive success, not the other way around. Which of the following is an example of a heritable characteristic? Heritable meaning it can be inherited from your parents. It can be passed on through genes from your parents down to you. Possessed by an animal that will improve its reproductive potential and survival. So in other words, which of these is something you can inherit from your mom and dad that makes you better at living? Yep, it's not A, because that's not something you inherit from your parents. Uh, it's not C, because use of tools, learn through experience. That's the key word there. You don't inherit experience, right? So we know it's not C. Male dominance in a pack of wolves, that's, again, not something you can inherit. But you can inherit color and shape from your parents. Because that's genetics. Which of the following best explains why a finite supply of environmental resources is important to differential reproductive success, meaning some people are more successful in making babies and passing on their genes than others? Why is a finite, you know what finite means? Limited, yes. It's the opposite of infinite. Infinite means unlimited. Finite means limited. There's only a certain amount, okay? Uh, so this creates an environment, just like we were talking about earlier in the other question, of competition. It increases the competition. More competition means uh, only the stronger ones or the most fit ones can survive, right? So if everyone had everything they needed, and all the resources they needed, there'd be no competition, and therefore, even the weak ones could survive, and that's not natural selection. Weak ones growing up to pass on their genes. That's not how natural selection works. So we need a limited supply of stuff so only so many people can get it, which increases competition, which increases natural selection. So, um, some members of a population survive competition but never reproduce. I mean, that's true, but that has nothing to do with finite supply. Uh, natural selection does not occur when the environment limits the supply of resources. That's not true. Limited resources create selection pressures for survival in the population. That is true. Right? Okay, we need a limited amount of resources so that we can increase the competition for those resources. All right, only two more, I believe. I think this is the next to last one. Okay, what does the ability to produce up to 100 offspring increase, or I'm sorry, why does that ability increase the fitness of scorpions? You don't even need to look at this graph. All you need to know is that scorpions they can have 100 babies at a time. 
How does that help them to survive? If you have 100 babies and 90% get eaten, you still have 10 babies, right? So the more babies you have, the more likely you are, or the more likely it is, that some of those babies, just by chance, will grow up old enough to pass on their genes and have their own babies, right? And the one that's saying that is, yes, D. It increases the probability that some offspring will survive long enough to reproduce and pass on their genes, right? It's just a numbers game. Like, hey, I know I'm going to lose 1,000 babies. But if I have 1,200 babies, I still got 200 babies, right? Okay, is this the last one? This is the last one, good. All right, a teacher asked the students to describe the relationship between finite resources and differential reproductive success. We've already answered the same question. Remember, we talked about this twice already in two previous questions. Here's some of their responses below. Which of these responses correctly explains why finite resources is important to natural selection. Again, we've already said it. All we have to do is do it one more time. Anybody tell me what it is? Which one accurately explains why it's important to have a highly competitive environment to increase the fitness of the species? One, organisms with, are you just guessing? Yes. Okay, let's look at three. The population will immediately adapt to needing different resources so they can survive to reproduce and pass on their genes. No, that's not really how it works. You don't, you don't, they don't get together and say, okay, guys, we're running low on this stuff. We need to figure something out quick. That's not what they do, right? It's like they're either, they can either hack it or they can't. Um, the entire population will die out since none of them will be able to successfully, will the entire population die out in a competitive environment? Well, probably not. Only the weakest ones that can't compete for resources will die out, not the entire uh, species. They will mate with different species. Okay, first of all, you already know that's wrong. You can't mate with the different species, right? I mean, you can try. <laughs> but a baby will not come as a result of it, right? So it's got to be one, yeah. which is correct, but you guess, so it doesn't no, count. Uh huh. Organisms with favorable adaptations will be better able to obtain these finite resources and therefore live longer and pass on their genes. All right. Are we, we are done. Yeah. That was the last time you'll ever have to hear me talk for this year. <laughs>